<laughs> um, I'll, I'll just talk about the Sagmore model. Um, <laughs> so, um, I guess most of you have um, used this, used the um, variable rates one model before. So, but um, what I want to do in this presentation is highlight a lot of the um, uh, differences that um, there are in the new version. Um, outline of the talk, I just want to um, briefly describe variable rates one and why we needed to upgrade to VR2, the data that we used in its development, and then go through a series of um, well, various parts of the VR2 model and um, how, it's, how it looks like in JK SimMap and if we have time, a quick demo, demonstration of it running. Um, I want to begin with an, with an apology, um, not the butchering this quote, but um, because uh, these SimMap models, they do contain a few uh, dodgy things um, and I might expose some of those in this talk. Um, in terms of modelling approaches, there's a number of different ways you can categorise models. Um, ideally, you have a theoretical or physically based model, and we're hoping that our models in the future can be like this. Um, but generally, uh, or quite often, we, re we resort to these black box models, empirical models that basically don't have a lot of um, knowledge about the physical process, um, and they're pretty unreliable, out, um, especially outside of the range that you've collected your data over, and even within that, um, can be pretty ordinary. Um, I, I dream that we could get our models into the halfway uh, situation where they'd be at least semi-empirical, but a lot of our models, as you'll see, are still uh, somewhere between empirical and semi-empirical. So the VR1 structure uh, is based on Leung's model. And Leung's model has a population balance, I should be using this one, has a population balance uh, that converts the feed into a product and calculates the load. And it has two main parts, a mass transfer and discharge function and a breakage function. And these are then, um, uh, split into a couple of other, other functions and overlaid on top of that there's a variable rates model developed by uh, Steve Morell and Rob Morrison about 20 years ago and what this model does is it, um, it um, overlays some regression models that then feed some predictive information to some of these um, functions here, and it also uh, on the mass transfer, so and also on the um, breakage rate. So if you change the operating conditions of the mill, it will try to predict a new set of uh, breakage rates and a new discharge uh, rate. And on the side, it also calculates the Morel power equation. Um, but that is not used uh, in recalculating the breakage rates. It's just an output on the side. So why upgrade? Um, well, SAG mills have um, evolved considerably since the VR1 was developed, um, mostly to um, increase capacity. We have bigger mills, large ports, um, steel balls are getting bigger and the ball loads are um, increasing as well. We have curved pulp lifters, uh, more efficient mill drives, and circuit configurations also have been, um, or new circuit configurations have also been introduced, in particular pre crushing with really large crushes and HPGR. Uh, so our models need to be able to cope with all of these. Uh, changes. 
The, the other reason is the SAD model is actually quite difficult to use if you want to use it to its fullest extent. Um, and there are actually only a handful of experts who really know how to use this model um, really well, to, that they understand the limitations, they know the undocumented tricks, and um, they have side spreadsheets, data sets and experience that they can draw from. Um, but this isn't, all of this is knowledge is not built into the model and uh, that's, that's a bit of a problem. The other thing is the original model development um, database and the workflow that was used to uh, create the regression equations doesn't exist at the JK. Some, somewhere along the line that's been lost. And a big problem about that is um, the various work that's um, taken place at the JK, for example, around discharge, appearance functions, and so on, they're, they're, they're not easily able to be added into the variable rates model because they need to be, re the regression equations need to be re-regressed once a, mod a change is made to the model itself. So there's been plenty of work at the JK on the Sagamore model, but the variable rates model has remained static. So um, a part of the, a really important part of the work that I've done is in um, implementing uh, the, the, the new database that allows further future research um, able to be, impl um, up to be um, um, implemented in SIMMET. So it's not, it's not the regression equations that I've developed in this, um, this piece of work, that they may have a quite a short lifespan, but hopefully um, if these mo models are uh, improved in the future, they can be easily re-regressed and the database can be expanded and so on. So as um, Grant mentioned, the uh, VR2 project's been around for a while. Um, in about 2010, Tony Kovic did a lot of work on this um, and he built on Leung's uh, 1987 um, model of um, the SAGMIL, and it was an old Fortran code, GCM version 3, before indentation was invented. And um, the model had a number of different improvements. It, it had the um, size dependent MPQ appearance function, it had a sixth rate knot at 75 microns and it also uh, attempted to use a power-based um, um, uh, e energy level calculation to distribute the energy by particle surface area to replace the um, S20 equation which is um, one of the weaknesses of the current uh, VR1 model. So this was published in um, uh, 2011 at the SAG conference and 2012 at the MILOPS conference, but it was still only a simulate only model and it didn't have the ability to predict rates at different um, conditions. So um, this still wasn't able to replace the VR1 model. And our aim at the time was to simulate a wider range of uh, conditions with greater confidence to be able to uh, model all the, uh, the bimodal and pre-crushed feeds, uh, a wide filling range, large mills, and so on. A challenge with modeling uh, sag mills is they're all different. Um, they've got uh, a wide range of mill geometries. Um, the amount and size of grinding media can vary significantly. Grates and pulp lifter designs are quite varied and you have different discharge configurations, um, different ways to control them. Um, circuit designs vary, feed properties also, um, size and hardness vary significantly. So to model that, we really need lots of data for model development. Uh, fortunately, we've got a lot of new data, uh, data sets that we've been able to draw from. Um, Here's a um, list of some of these data sets. There's been a lot of work at the JK um, 
um, in collecting various um, data. You've got, for example, at Cadia, they ran the mill with, um, from ag mode. They started it up in ag mode, then um, with and without recycle crushers, um, increased the ball load each time taking, um, uh, doing full surveys of the mill and uh, right up to 14% filling. And then more recently, uh, they've, they've installed a HPGR pre-crushing to that circuit. So that one mill has undergone a lot of uh, changes and they've also had a change in the grate from uh, radial to curved pulp lifters as well. Um, LKAB, there was a um, um, series of surveys there with a range of fillings, including Marcos dumping the entire content of the um, mill load, which is quite rare. Um, there's, um, courtesy of uh, Malcolm, there's a, a lot of um, data sets from South African uh, gold and platinum mines as well. And from JK Tech, uh, um, a um, variety of surveys, all with MPQ, um, or characterization data. Uh, there's, it would have been nice to have received all this data in uh, a consistent format, but that wasn't the case. Um, there was, of course, um, these came in spreadsheets of various kinds, uh, JK CIMET files, P9 reports. So these had to be collated and, um, and put into a common format. Um, there's, when you're doing this sort of exercise, there's always issues with data quality, uh, having to cross check and clean up information. You're missing bits of information here and there. Um, you find um, transcription errors. Um, you don't know whether, um, sometimes whether the data is measured or calculated. Um, so when you start to use the, the um, data in modeling, you see that things don't add up and um, you find that you have to um, recheck information. Um, so it, it's quite, quite an exercise. As well as that, um, in our new modeling, we wanted more information about the grates, pulp lifters, um, drive types and so on, and also the MPQ information for the ore characterization. So all of that had to be um, um, found for data sets where we don't normally uh, report those in JKSIMET, for example. And if you're lucky, you find those, these, some of these information in a report or some other um, source of information. So um, having gone through this exercise, uh, we now have more than 150 industrial data sets as well as the um, original 60 plus pilot mill data sets. <laughs> Uh, and they cover a quite a wide range. So uh, we have mills in diameter from 10 to 40 foot, um, wide range of aspect ratios, um, great um, apertures from um, 10 to 90. Um, we've got ball filling from fully ag mode to right up to uh, ROM ball mill. Total filling from why bother to uh, that's too much, um, and ball, ball top size as well from um, 70 to 6 inch. Um, power, and this is just for the industrial ones, um, from half a megawatt to 20. Um, there are mills that are bigger than these, um, but this is a um, quite a nice range for. Uh, doing the modelling work. So I'll start um, going through the changes that have been made to the model. So looking now at the um, discharge. Uh, in VR1, uh, it uses the morell stevenson discharge function. And this was actually developed for um, using great only um, data. So the model form um, is J is proportional to uh, flow, well, the hold up is proportional to flow rate um, or the square root of the flow rate. 
um, which is which is fine if you're if you're doing if you have a brake only mill, but if you have a pulp lifter, the curve goes in the opposite direction. Um, so you get the incorrect correct, incorrect response there for um, mills with pulp lifters, and most of ours um, do. In fact, the entire database doesn't have a grade only discharge. They're they're quite uh, quite rare. Um, it also because of this um, over predicts the effect of open area and radial position and as I said it doesn't consider the pulp lifters which are um, uh, important so we, we have this research that was done but um, this hasn't been able to be um, implemented in the VR1 model so um, to um, to model the uh, discharge, you first have to look at the mechanisms of flow uh, taking place in a sag mill. So looking side on at the mill, you've got transport of um, slurry through the mill charge. The slurry has to pass through the grates. As the mill rotates, it has to be lifted um, to the top. But as it does that, um, slurry can pour back into the mill um, and that's called flowback. You can also, um, some of that slurry might not um, fall, fall and it might actually just continue in the pulp lift chamber and that's called carryover. So that returns back into the um, base of the pulp lifter. And the remaining material uh, comes out of the mill and that's, that's what's uh, discharged. So there's a lot of different mechanisms by which um, um, kind of material uh, can flow and and um, and reduce the ability to, for it to be discharged. So, um, what I did was to calculate a nominal discharge capacity of the pulp lifter. So, if you assume a simple geometry where you have a pulp lifter, it's um, rotating at a certain speed, it's filled to a certain amount, it's got a certain size, you can calculate um, how much material will uh, actually uh, be, um, could theoretically be lifted by that pulp lifter uh, of that size. So if we uh, use, some, use some numbers for, um, for a 40 foot sagonal example, um, if you do the <coughs> crunch the numbers, you, you, you get a quite a large capacity. This is about four times the actual discharge for this particular mill. So what this says is there's a lot of inefficiency due to uh, things like the transport through the charge, flowback, and carryover. Um, these are quite tricky to peel apart, but um, it says that these are very significant. Uh, carryover, we can have some estimate of um, what this might be. Um, if you model the pulp lifter as a um, using, for example, DM or using a um, scale model, you can um, do experiments and for different um, pulp lifter designs, you can work out um, the fraction of the material that uh, remains in the mill due to its centrifuging and what what can come out and create a um, function that relates that, uh, relates the pulp lifter efficiency to mill speed. Um, so for uh, radial pulp lifters, the um, pulp lifter efficiency drops away quite rapidly at um, speeds faster than about 70% um, uh, critical speed, whereas curved pulp lifters, that drop off takes place a lot later than that. There's another mechanism that takes place if you have very high fillings. So, um, when the mill, when the slurry in the mill reaches a, a, a point above the trunnion, it can simply pour out. So the pulp lifter doesn't play a role there, and you can. Um, calculate using Bernoulli equation um, what flow rate you, you might expect 
um, once it reaches that point. You don't want this to take place, but um, it is good to have this in the model. Um, so that um, mechanism is also um, there for when the, uh, when the level is above the trunnion. So um, we, here we use the database to um, regress everything else. So if we can write the equa an equation for the overall uh, mill capacity as a function of the theoretical maximum capacity, uh, a factor for um, the loss due to the speed and the overflow, um, what uh, is discharged due to the overflow. And this factor here, the, the grate, F grate, um, can be regressed to the database. And if you do that, you get a, um, a, re a regression. It's not all that great, but um, it does show that the capacity increases with finer feed size, with a higher ball to rock ratio, uh, with more dilute slurry, uh, more lifter compartments, and with softer ores. Um, so um, that that's the uh, that regression equation has replaced um, the morell stevenson equation, which plotted on the same graph looks like that. It's so it, it, even though the equation is not fantastic, it is an improvement. Uh, now the classification function um, that the discharge classification uh, has a shape like so from experimental data. Um, in VR1, this model is um, modeled as a stepwise linear function with four parameters and three of which can be fitted. And in the new model, um, this has been replaced with a screen efficiency curve and um, and you can have a separate efficiency curve for grates and pebble ports. So you have a smooth continuous function rather than this stepwise function and um, it has fewer parameters. So um, I think that's an improvement in itself. Um, the power model, as I said, this is um, in the current model um, tucked away on the side. Um, the Morel power model um, is um, it's, it's a um, re really good model. Uh, we've, we've used it for a long time uh, and it's usually uh, very accurate. Uh, for some reason in South America, they tend to be using the hog for rest in our model. Um, but um, this is, I think, far superior. Uh, it's got a series of inputs. Um, which are all uh, fairly easily measurable, um, and but it um, it doesn't model the slurry pool except for overflow bore mill mode. So it, it assumes that the slurry level reaches the uh, trunnion lip, and um, so when you when modelling a small slurry pool, it doesn't get that right. Um, fortunately, it can be easily modified which is what I've done. Um, so based on work of Lacharetti Morel, they suggest that um, the, the slurry um, works its way down from the shoulder down to the toe. And this is how it's been modeled um, in an identical way. And then as, as the slurry, the, the amount of slurry exceeds void fill fraction one, it starts forming a slurry pool, which then uh, increases in height. So if the, the standard Morel model uh, as a function of slurry void fill fraction gives a linear response, by modeling it in this way, um, you actually get a peak um, and then it drops off. Um, and this is what you observe in, um, in practice. So as the slurry pool develops, uh, it provides a counterbalance to the um, to the charge. The power starts dropping. So this has been implemented in the um, uh, VR2 model. Um, 
Also, the, um, we had a look at the no load model. And in practice, um, the no load is difficult to measure. Um, and it's based on a very small set of data. Um, it treats all drive types the same. Uh, these days we have a few different um, drive types. So we, we have, for, for example, high speed. The, the standard is, has been the high speed um, motors with a gearbox, but there's also now uh, quite popular, especially in North America and South America, the low speed drives um, where you don't have a gearbox. And these, uh, the efficiency of these is almost as high as for um, gearless mill drives. And the no load expression has been replaced by, um, by efficiency factors um, rather than that, that equation. And that reflects the different efficiencies between different types. So again, using the database, um, the um, power model was recalibrated and the MAGIC 1.26 number has been updated to the MAGIC 1.252 number, um, otherwise pretty much the same. Also within the power model, um, there's a couple of factors developed by Morel um, dis um, describing the impact and abrasion or proportion of impact and abrasion taking place in the mill. And they're given by these equations. Um, the power model also calculates these factors and these are used um, later on in uh, estimating the uh, mill breakage. So um, the moving on to the high energy appearance function, uh, we didn't touch the low energy um, appearance function, um, not because it doesn't need to be touched, but um, because there wasn't a lot of data around uh, that would be use useful for replacing it. Um, for the um, high energy appearance function, Leon uses the, the T10 equation that we're all familiar with, but in the SAG model, there's also an energy level function that calculates this ECS as a function of size. Um, so when you apply the size dependent um, breakage function, there then becomes two size dependent elements within that T10 function, which I'm still trying to understand how, uh, how it might work. So um, at the early stages of the project, we proposed an energy distribution function that was energy consistent. And the model um, <coughs> proposed that the sum of the breakage ECS value should be equivalent to the total mill power. And so the, the specific energy from the power model would be distributed according to surface area um, of particles in the charge. Um, but as the particle size distribution, at, at the fine end of this particle size distribution, there's a huge amount of surface area in the ultra fine, so there was a, there was a cutoff at a sub-sieve size. Um, this resulted in a different um, slope of the ECS function, so, um, and unfortunately, uh, when applying this to the model, I couldn't get this to work um, and we had to look for an alternative. So, oops. So again, going back to the database, um, we're able to fit all of the, um, so once the, the new model structure had been implemented, the <coughs> model was refitted to um, refitted to each, each um, data set. You can see there uh, examples of um, how the breakage rates vary for different um, portions of the data set from different mines. Um, you, I, you, I, I was um, seeing this response for, in particular, ag mills, where, where the breakage rate for the final knot 
comes down um, with this quite di distinct shape. Um, and if you look at the data in different ways, you can see that um, there are there is some rhyme and reason to to this. You can uh, see the effect of ball filling, for example, from ag mode up as you increase the um, ball filling. Um, the coarse knots tend to rise uh, or in increase, whereas the fine fine knots tend to um, drop down. And this is um, what we've seen in the previous model as well. Um, uh, specific energy, um, if you carve up the database in that way, you can see um, that as you increase the specific energy, more of the energy goes into the fractions. So from um, looking at these um, uh, and applying, uh, doing some regressions on the uh, on these individual rate knots. Um, this is the same way as um, Steve Morell did it um, for the VR1. So in VR1, um, rate knot 5 is a function of um, various mill um, operating conditions, uh, in particular the mill speed, F80, ball filling, F80, and the ball size. And the rate, rate knot 4 depends on rate not five as as well as other operating conditions and likewise rate three depends on rate four um, the what i found was the rate not five actually has a fair bit of uncertainty uncertainty to it so it's actually not a good one to peg to and uh, i found that either using rate not four or rate not three is actually more, uh, is a much better overall model. So starting with rate knot four, which is a function of the operating conditions, and then rate knots five and three depend on rate four. And likewise, um, um, for subsequent rate knots. So a series of regression equations um, describe how um, the fitted rate knots respond to operating conditions. So uh, using a different set of um, um, operating conditions that uh, the regression uh, modeling found was significant. Now, here's um, a diagram of the, comparing the model structures. Uh, so in, in the um, variable rates one model, we have the Leon model, and wrapped around that is the VR2, sorry, the, the VR1 uh, model. It pre calculates the mass transfer and breakage rate values, and it passes it to the Leon model. It calculates the discharge, energy level, breakage, and then the population balance, and it uh, uses that to converge. It never comes back to uh, recalculate the breakage um, rates um, and at the end it calculates the power. So in the VR2 these uh, functions that are calculated in advance in VR1 are now contained within the main iteration loop. So that's a, that's a key difference. So the discharge um, depends on the middle filling and as the material breaks and it's discharged um, it um, the, the, the discharge needs to be recalculated. Uh, the, um, the new filling level affects the breakage rates and so on. So it's a uh, more complex convergence. There's a lot more calculations going on in there. In addition to that, the power model um, is then used in the breakage rates uh, to, um, and, and as the mill filling uh, changes, the, the power draw changes, which then affects the rates. So it's a, um, it, it's, a it's a more more complex convergence. Um, the the other thing that um, it must the, the model must do is um, at the end of the 
population balance, it calculates the size distribution and quantity of um, solids in the load. Um, you somehow need then to divide that load into a coarse component and a fine component. Um, so pictured here is um, um, a two different size distributions. And if you have coarse material in the load, it bulks out the charge. Uh, if you have very little coarse material in the load, um, then the, um, the fine material forms a slurry above the charge. So um, um, so in the Leung model, there's, there's slur um, slurry is defined as um, water and particles finer than XG. The problem with that is XG can be um, can be in a very wide range. Um, in VR2, we've defined, we've tied it down to a single value of um, half an inch, and that's approximately the size uh, of the um, spacing between grinding media. So if you, if you imagine um, three three grinding media in a in a in 2D or four in 3D, uh, that spacing between is approximately um, half an inch. Um, and if we interpolate that load size distribution and um, treat the material finer than that size as slurry and, and material coarser than that as coarse rock, we can then um, convert that load size distribution into a total filling, slurry filling and void fill fraction. And the slurry filling can be used to calculate the uh, discharge rate, the total filling and void fill fraction used in the um, power model and breakage um, model. Um, give you an idea of what, it's, what it looks like in SimMet now um, and what changes have taken place. Um, in SimMet, uh, you won't see the original rates uh, or original dimensions or values anymore. Um, they, they didn't really um, do much um, anyway. Um, all of the mill geometry information is in a single tab, uh, including the <coughs> volume which used to be in the power tab. Um, the grates and pulp lifter um, tab, uh, it has a lot more information about the, the grates, including the pulp lifter depth, um, the number of compartments, um, whether it's radial or curved, um, and it, um, and you have a predicted discharge uh, volume there, which, if you, if you, um, which can be um, adjusted using a correction factor, which is which is fitable. Uh, ball load is very similar to um, the current one. Um, charge composition, uh, sorry, uh, breakage rates. Uh, there's an extra knot at um, 75 microns. Um, and the breakage function, it includes the MPQ information there. Um, we, um, I haven't done a whole lot of work around the MPQ. Uh, MPQ. Unfortunately, the, most of the database only had A times B, so um, the regressions are still based on, on that. Um, the recycles, they've been eliminated because um, these weren't found to be significant in the new model fit. Um, there's the um, calculated parameters, which is before, um, and then there's a new tab for experimental data um, for total filling, void fill fraction, and gross power, which can be added together with their SDs. And um, there's also a neat little filling calculator. So if you um, enter the charge to repipe, it will update the um, total filling measurement there. So that's that's helpful as well. Um, also helpful is this um, inputs tab. So uh, these input inputs are um, you don't have to scroll through all of the uh, tabs. You can um, uh, enter all of input values in a single thing. Um, 
which is handy if you're just copying from Excel. And these values will then be reflected in other tabs. Uh, if possible, I'd like to do a uh, quick demo. I don't have a huge amount of time, but uh, otherwise I'm near the end anyway. So you can see here there's a um, there's two mills here side by side. Um, the one on the left is the VR2, um, and the one on the right is VR1. Yep. Um, so we can um, we can um, set the rates. Um, oops. So we can um, simulate the simulate this with um, with default rates, uh, setting those at zero, or we can then uh, refit these and. At the moment, it still does take a while to converge, but um, it does eventually get there. So this, this is fitting both. It does take a while. There, there is there is a convergence issue that um, we still need to do a bit, bit more work on it, but um, the. But the model does um, does work. Uh, we do give a number of um, warning messages. There are some additional uh, warning messages that have been added to the uh, model. Um, so here it says um, the the grates are quite large relative to the um, ball size. So. Uh, So it's um, pre-fitted those, and both both models give a similar fit. The VR2 model gives us a, a different mill load, um, um, but um, let's say if we change the feed, uh, let's um, up the feed by say around 15% on both of these. Um, if we simulate, uh, you can see that VR2 uh, has increased load from 30% to 41. Um, VR1 has gone from 30 to 33. Um, that's um, as, as as we know the uh, VR1 model doesn't respond to different um, filling levels uh, um, correctly. Um, and um, the new model um, <coughs> predicts a much higher load, um, which you would expect from such a large feed rate change. Um, likewise, if we go down a lot, Models respond um, reasonably similarly, I guess. Um, so um, the model does work, um, and it's ready now for um, testing. And um, so uh, maybe go back to the. I'm, I'm happy to demonstrate a bit more if, if um, people have time to go on.
So yeah, when you get a chance, um, please have a play and um, let us know what you think. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, several people who've um, worked on this model. Um, with me, uh, Malcolm in particular, uh, Tony Koyovic uh, in the early days, uh, to Piwa and uh, Chris Bailey from JK Tech who have um, um, also overseen the project, um, and Michal, um, who's um, who did who translated the code from the clunky Fortran to a much better Fortran, and Ian, who um, has translated into VR um, into the Simet version that you see there, and been really patient over the last five months getting getting that working and uh, helping incredibly with that um, and of course the um, um, this, this model is based on um, or built on building on past research at the JK by a huge number of uh, present former JK MIC at JK Tech staff and students um, and probably forgotten uh, left out some important names there, but um, there's there's been a huge community of people who have um, contributed to the uh, variable rates model. So thank you.